It's been said that DRM, anti-tamper or anti-piracy measures are also anti-consumer. In other words, they hurt the end user more than they help. As an example, many PC games from older times simply won't run on modern PCs. Digital-only console games may get removed from digital storefronts due to licensing issues or simply because the storefront inevitably will shut down. It's true, however, that some of these issues have been addressed. Thanks to sites like GOG who offer DRM-free versions of older games, usually running under DOSBox, which is a DOS and Windows emulator that plays nice with modern systems. And on the consoles, games from older generations may get a remaster or end up on a collection. But this isn't always the case. Many games simply will never be brought forward. But there is also another consideration. Games development is expensive and if these DRM and anti-tamper measures weren't implemented, the argument is that it would account for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions in lost revenue. By simply making copies of games on CDs without protection may lead to reduced sales. And almost every development company out there has to deal with piracy and different companies dealt with it in different ways, some more successfully than others. For a company like EA, they learned a hard lesson with the game Spore, a disastrous heavy-handed DRM measure forced users to download pirated versions in order to play the game that they actually paid for. If you were a PC gamer in the late 90s to 2000s, you were probably right at home with games coming on CD. Almost every game required the CD to be in the drive at all times. If you made a copy of the disc and tried to use the copy instead of the original, the game was usually smart enough to know it was a copy. And there was also CD virtual drives. An application known as Daemon Tools would install a virtual drive on your PC and allow you to mount an ISO image to it. Essentially, Windows believes that it was just another CD drive. But some CD anti-tamper DRMs were able to detect the presence of virtual drives. These DRM CD protections did not stop piracy. In response, the scene started releasing what was known as no CD cracks. Simple patches to the executable or game files to essentially strip out the CD authentication checks. While these cracks main purpose was for piracy of course, ironically today, Many of these no CD cracks are essential for playing vintage PC games on a modern PC. By the early 2000s, CD DRM measures had become increasingly sophisticated. A Russian company known as Protection Technology released a new DRM that was known as Starforce. At a glance, this just looked like another CD authentication check protection mechanism, but in reality, it was anything but. Before Starforce, most CD-based protection was essentially a key or digital signature pressed onto a disk that was impossible or very difficult to copy. Starforce used a different approach that was multi-tiered. First of all, the executable and many of its game files were encrypted. Each master disk has individual physical parameters that are unique to each disk that's pressed. Those parameters make up a unique 24-byte key. That key is also embedded into the executable and files of the game. The protection simply is if the physical parameters of the disk match the key embedded in the executable and the disk is in the physical drive, the game will pass its protection check and boot. Simple enough? Starforce began appearing in games as early as 2003. By 2005, it was at its third revision and Splinter Cell Chaos Theory by Ubisoft took over 400 days to crack. This was unprecedented. Anti-piracy methods like SecuROM and SafeDisk were annoying enough for most end users, but they were easily defeated by hackers pretty quickly and easily. But Starforce was something else entirely. With over 400 days to crack Splinter Cell Chaos Theory on the PC, this was a next level form of protection. So let's go ahead and take a look and see how it actually works. Since the early days of Windows NT, there has been security implemented in all Windows operating systems. Just like something like Linux, where you have user administration and even root level access, Windows has a similar thing, tiers or levels of privilege known as rings. Ring 3 is user or application level, so any utility, game or code you write will run at this level. 
Rings 1 and 2 are generally not used by Windows, and Ring 0 is the kernel level, the highest tier, where you have unrestricted access to the entire operating system, the keys to the castle if you will. We mentioned earlier that Starforce gathered the native physical parameters of the CD. In order to achieve this, Starforce would silently install a device driver in Windows known as the Starforce Protection Driver, and depending on the version of Starforce, something else known as a VFS driver, which we'll come back to in a minute. Early versions of Starforce would install these drivers on the target machine at Ring O level, with full and unrestricted access to the user's machine and hardware, which did not even inform the user. As you can imagine, this was a cause for some concern. It's also worth noting that most games contain a EULA or End User License Agreement, which outlines the agreement between the user and the license in place. There is no mention of Starforce in any EULAs in any games that supported Starforce. But let's go back to the protection. The VFS driver is for the virtual file system. Starforce creates a small virtual machine on the target machine which can contain one or many of the game data files, which are usually encrypted. Essentially, any Starforce game can be running in real mode, then access the virtual machine to decrypt and read files from, and then return back to real mode. There was no universal standard on how protection was established. It varied from game to game, and was extremely difficult to crack. In the past, for Securom, there were generic patcher tools. In this case, it would simply not apply for Starforce. Attempting to crack Starforce was very challenging. Generally speaking, a hacker would use a debugger that could access the kernel or at the ring O level. Softice was a very popular kernel debugger at the time. But the crackers relied on using a method known as int3. By sending an interrupt to the debugger would temporarily replace an instruction in a running program in order to set a breakpoint. This meant the hacker would get a good look at the running code and come up with ways to bypass protection checks. Starforce would simply check for those interrupts and redirect them elsewhere to throw the debuggers off. In fact, INT3 was used as part of the protection itself. Make no mistake, Starforce was some of the best anti-piracy, anti-tamper that was ever created. But this all came at a cost. End users started to learn about what Starforce was doing to their PCs, installing device drivers at the highest level of privilege with no real understanding of what it was doing is an absolute red flag. Worse still, uninstalling games that use Starforce such as Race Driver 2, Broken Sword 3 and Silent Storm did not remove Starforce itself. The problem was Starforce left lots of residual files behind and it wasn't an easy task to clean all traces of the DRM off a machine and in the end a dedicated Starforce removal tool was developed for this purpose. Then there was the problem with the dual CD-ROM drives. If you had more than one CD drive connected, Starforce would not pass its authentication check unless you physically disconnected one. Starforce was also included on many game demos. The reasoning was that the game companies did not want hackers referring to the demo to find clues on how to crack the main game when it came out. Many users started reporting issues with their PCs after Starforce protected games were installed. Complaints about slow CD-ROM speeds, blue screens of death, random reboots and more were common. The company denied this, but because of the kernel level access to the system meant that these crashes could not be ruled out. It was found out that Starforce would sometimes step down the IDE speeds and in some cases even disable DMA or direct memory access of the CD-ROM drive. This meant that you could no longer play audio CDs for example. This was also confirmed by PC Gamer Magazine editor at the time, Greg Vetterman, who stated, Last year my work PC suddenly began blue screening anytime I popped an audio CD into either of my two optical drives. I went online and learned that other people were having the same problem and that it appeared to be Starforce related. Deleting my Starforce protected games did nothing. I had to run a Starforce removal utility before my system, filled only with legal, licensed software, could play audio CDs again. By 2006, the backlash for Starforce was immense with many users and websites labeling it as a rootkit, malware, or even a trojan. Users would often turn to the developers to ask for help with Starforce, only to be told that they should contact Starforce directly. At the time, Ubisoft was the largest publisher of games that used Starforce and was subject to a $5 million lawsuit. Due to Ubisoft's intentional use of the highly controversial copy protection scheme Starforce, 
Despite user protests and purposeful deletion of any forum discussions about the protection, Christopher Spence has filed a $5 million lawsuit against the company for use of crippling DRM in their games. Starforce has been reported to cause system instability, slowdowns, and possible damage to optical drives, as well as questionable business practices when dealing with customers and other companies. While the case was dropped due to lack of evidence, it didn't really matter. The public outcry and perception that this DRM was a rootkit spread like wildfire. Ubisoft ran a user poll on their forums, and the overwhelming response was against its use. Ubisoft then dropped Starforce in favor of the competition, Securom. But Starforce held firm, offering no apologies for their DRM methods. In fact, they went after and threatened lawsuits on people who spoke out against it. Cory Doctorow, whose website boycott Starforce, was threatened with a lawsuit unless he removed the insults, lies, and false accusations. Starforce PR also sidestepped the EULA question by arguing that it didn't matter if Starforce was not explicitly mentioned. If you clicked I agree, then you are agreeing to it, even though it came installed as a hidden device driver. But to be fair, Starforce did later on reduce its privileges from Ring 0 to Ring 3 and listen to customer feedback. There is also questions about the validity of the claims causing problems to users' PCs. Starforce offered large sums of cash for people who could replicate problems that many had reported. These were never claimed. Most of these problems are addressed with the release of the Starforce removal tool. But the Starforce PR did not handle this well either. According to our research, those of users that do run into compatibility problems are beginner level hackers that try to go around our protection system. What can't be questioned, however, is the underhanded approach. The hidden device drivers, the fact that it leaves traces behind, the uninstalled utility was also called into question whether it cleaned everything up. End users began boycotting Starforce games because they just didn't want to deal with the problems and any potential issues on their PCs. The legacy left behind of Starforce is also worth mentioning. From Windows Vista onward, attempting to install a Starforce game, such as Peter Jackson's King Kong, would almost certainly blue screen, and in many instances require a complete reinstall of the operating system. It would also get stuck in repair mode, and safe mode would also not work. These issues were so bad that newer versions of most games like the Steam release of King Kong and Splinter Cell Chaos Theory had Starforce protection removed. But other games, like Trackmania Sunrise, simply cannot be played on a modern PC, and the game developers aren't interested in the removal of Starforce because it's a low priority issue. I should mention a couple of things. Starforce, the company, is still around today and they are quite successful in their security business. They don't really do copy protection for games anymore because obviously things like De Nuvo have really taken that mantle as the kind of de facto copy protection standard on the PC these days. But Starforce is still around, the website is still up and they do offer their services for copy protection mechanisms in different use cases. But it's interesting to see that they never really took much of a hit after the backlash from the PC and the loss of the Ubisoft deal as well. Now the other thing I should mention is there is a really good write-up on the technical aspects of Starforce and I'm going to tell you guys I don't really know the intricate details of how the protection works and how it was cracked. There are some really interesting guides that you can take a look at to get more information on that. So I will leave a link in the description below to some really good guides and links that I think are useful if you are interested in learning more about the technical aspects of Starforce and how the protection was actually defeated. Well guys, we're going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up and as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.